All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Coach Eric Eisenhut, and I'm going to be with you along with Coach Taylor Payne. Um, I currently am a proud United Goalkeeping Alliance member, and I currently coach with the Robert Morris University women's team here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, from a U.S. youth soccer standpoint, I work with the Region East goalkeeper coaching staff within ODP, as well as the director of goalkeeping with PA West. Um, I was, a, was in the corporate finance game for 18 years before I quit to do essentially coaching full time. And it's one of the best decisions of my life. I love working with children and I'm good at that. And if you have any questions, and again, this is for you, please ask. And again, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, our agenda, here's what we're going to kind of chat about today. Which club is best <clears throat> for your goalkeeper and what to look for when looking for a club? Is it best to be a backup on a great team or a starter on a decent team? Goalkeeping development, what do they offer at your club? And then the tryout process, the do's and don'ts. And we're going to speak to that in great detail towards the end. Um, so what to look for in a club? What, let me just ask and kind of start conversation around this. What you tell me when you're looking for a club with your, for your goalkeeper, what exactly are you looking for to help with the development of your goalkeeper and to make sure they're in good hands? And you guys are all on mute, by the way. Uh, for me, it's dedicated time during practices for the keeper and not just the entire time just for field work. Yep. Um, that way they have room to grow. Also, does the club even focus on it? Um, the club my daughter's with, as you might be aware, but others might not, they held summer programs and winter programs dedicated to goalie um, on top of just field. So that's really attractive to me because then my daughter gets workouts over the summertime during the off time. That's awesome. Good, Erica. I like that. I like that. Others, Colette, what about yourself? Um, well, I, I'm not sure if I have like one of the oldest keepers on the call. He's an 07. Um, Right now, we're just trying to find a club for him to play at for the next coming season. You know, at this age, a lot of the clubs already have their teams together that have been together for many years, and it's really hard to get into a club yeah. at this age group. Um, so I think I, I always look for having a dedicated goalkeeper coach because I think that each goalkeeper coach gives different, um, has different styles. And it's always good to have more than one goalkeeper coach because, you know, we're always with Marcelo, but if there's another club that has another dedicated goalkeeper coach, that's good because he might be hitting on something that's different that Marcelo might not be hitting on with my son. I couldn't agree more with that. And, and a lot of goalkeeper coaches get very possessive of their, of their children, their goalkeepers, and they frown upon goalkeepers training with other goalkeeper coaches. I'm the exact opposite. I agree 100% with what you just said, Colette. The more people you can learn from, the better. It's like going to college. You don't go and study under one professor the, the whole four years you're there. You study, study under as many as you can on a focus, and this focus is goalkeeping. But you try and get in front of as many professors as you can to pick up different, different traits, different tricks. 100% agree. That's, that's great. Um, Robert, what about yourself, sir? Hey, uh, yeah, my daughter, she's a 2010. Uh, they have three uh, normal practices for the team and then one night specialized for goalie. Uh, she also does one additional night uh, at Modern Goalkeeper here in New Jersey. Um, they did actually recommend additional training outside the club. Uh, but I did have a question if you thought that one night specifically for goalies was enough. Um, and then just the three additional uh, practices for the team. Right. So, yeah, we're new. You know, it's her first year as a full time goalie. So. Gotcha. So she's training four times a night right now. One of them is a, is a goalkeeper specific session. Yes. Nice. With the club. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. We're going to, we'll get into that. That's, that's great to know. That's great to know. All right. Well, let me uh, kind of push down the list here. Um, I want you guys to know the difference between a goalkeeper trainer and a goalkeeper coach. There's definitely, definitely a difference. Um, 
a, a coach is someone who's going to speak to you about the ins and outs of the game, the tactical situations. They're going to help you understand um, almost like a, a, like a mental performance coach and coach you through slumps, coach you and speak to you about um, communication styles and connecting with your back line in a leadership role. A trainer is someone that you go down the other end of the field with, you work on specific techniques and you go back to your, you're back to your team. There's a huge difference. And a lot of clubs promote having goalkeeper coaches when in fact they have trainers. So I always look for the coach over the trainer, but again, some clubs only have one goalkeeper resource and that person just doesn't have the capability to be a coach for all the people on the, in the club. And in fact, they, are dumbed down, not because they don't, they want to, but because they don't have the time to be a full-time coach. They're actually a, a trainer. So keep, keep an eye out for those two. Um, individual development plans, ask clubs if they do development plans and is it from their head coach or is it a combination with their goalkeeper coach? Because you're going to want that type of feedback, that specific feedback, excuse me, um, that specific feedback from a goalkeeper coach around the, the, the specifics of the game. Um, do they have a training curriculum? The club season's nine months long, you know, ballpark figure. And the curriculum is an understanding as to what it is they're going to be focused on, whether it's by age, whether it's by team and tactical, the tactics, excuse me. Um, but is there a plan? And again, a lot of clubs don't. They'll just go down the other end of the field and, you know, they'll put them through some technical work and that's it. <clears throat> do they get game related feedback? Do they have their coach there at the games, giving them points during the game or after the game? And if it's after, are they getting video analysis? Are they seeing them in themselves in action and able to kind of dissect their play? Um, are they getting goalkeeper education? You know, a lot of younger kids in particular, um, they don't know the game and they don't know what they don't know. So they're sometimes just kind of in a, on a ship without a rudder, right? So if, if there's someone that can, you know, a coach there that can teach them in-game moments, teach them positioning when the ball's on the other side of the field, again, basic stuff, but things they might not know about. Maybe they just stand inside their six the whole time. Should they be doing that? Things like that, like little things. Um, and again, I mentioned the mental performance um, component to it. You know, goalkeeper coaching is a lot of, you know, we're psych we work with the kids. We speak to them. They go through slumps. We talk to them about the ups and downs because we've all been there. And a lot of head coaches don't understand that and have that capability. So looking for a coach that can share that type of um, dialogue with, with your goalkeeper is important. And then lastly, a lot of the people, a lot, a lot of goalkeepers, their goals are to get to college. So do they have a pathway and connections into the collegiate game? And what's their success rate? You know, and a lot of people might measure clubs based on the success rate of where they place kids, but are they placing kids for the good of the club and the ego of the club, or are they placing kids because that's the right spot for their kid, for their goalkeeper, their major, the size of the school, the distance from home? Are they taking all that into consideration? There's a lot there that might be new to you. Um, so before I ask for uh, questions or comments, Coach Taylor, is, is there anything you'd want to add or any of these that you'd want to highlight. Yeah, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Perfectly. Yeah, just got done running a session uh, out at my club. So I just wanted to hop on here while we were going. Like you said, a lot of teams don't really have goalkeeper coaches. They have trainers, right? And a lot of times trainers don't really focus on the mental aspect of goalkeeping, which as goalkeepers is really immense compared to a lot of other positions. It's not just so much as running up and down the field, chasing the ball, but it's your positioning. It's how you interact with the uh, players in front of you. How do you interact with the crowd that's behind you, right behind the goal? How do you interact with, you know, just that inner person talking to yourself after there's a mistake or after you have a successful moment, can you keep yourself composed? And uh, I think that's things that we have to value for our children, right? Because a lot of times they don't really even notice those things. They don't notice those like subtleties of the game. How do they, you know, come off the field after a hard match? And do they have someone, you know, on their side telling them, you know, it's okay. You had a bad night or you had a slump, whatever the case may be. 
is that, you know, person, their goalkeeper coach that they can relate to, or is that, you know, a trainer that just kind of taps them on the shoulder? Hey, I told you, you know, mark your six. Hey, I told you to drop a little deeper. And then that's it. What are they really getting? I love that, Taylor. I really do. That's, that's, that's important. That, that kind of in with this here, what, what stands out and what might be different than what you may be anticipated? Are you looking for parents to talk? Yeah. That? Yes. Yes. I, sorry, Colette. Okay. Yeah. So I'll say this. Is that um, for me? Nope. Every, um, Colette's going right now, Taylor. Thank you. I think because, you know, my son, he'll be 15. I wish that we would have had this. So like the younger parents on here with the younger kids, this is so important for you to listen to because as my son's going into the sophomore year of high school, I wish I would have known half of this stuff three years ago that just from the last 10 minutes. Um, Cause now we're at the tail end of his high school. I mean, even though we're in the beginning of his high school we're at the tail end of his high school and we could be at the tail end of his playing career. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's the one thing that I, the pathway to college, the egos of the club, you know, as you're saying that like light bulb moments are going off in my head. Um, I think it's also important to have your kids once they get to a certain age and Eric, you'll probably and Taylor the same thing is to get your kid with um, somebody who does personal training and watches the way that they run and the watches the way that they stand and make sure it's, if you do have a personal trainer, like my son's personal trainer was a college goalkeeper. So he knew exactly what he needed to work on. Um, but, you know, like I said, Eric, I wish, I wish, I would have <laughs> sat in this three years ago um, because yeah. I, things could have been different. For Colette, we, I, I get that a lot. I really do. And I feel the, the reason, one of the reasons why we started this, these free sessions for parents is for that exact comment and, and just helping parents understand what is goalkeeper coaching truly and what yeah. should, what can clubs do to help with this? And what parents, what, as parents, what you need to, the questions you need to ask of that club, because you're, you know, you think that your child is being interviewed by that club, but you as a parent should be interviewing that club. Bingo. It I should not be that, oh, you're getting your child all, you know, you better do good at this practice. You better do good at this tryout, which I am guilty of doing. Now, looking at this thinking, I should have said to those clubs, what are you going to do for my kid? what do you, what, what, like, these are, it's, we didn't have this five years ago, probably. I don't think there was anything like what you're doing, Eric and Taylor. Now, this is like, I'm just going to sit back and listen because, and maybe cry a little bit thinking like, I wish I would have had this. <laughs> don't do that to us. <laughs> you know, parents like suck all this in because this is so important for the new keepers out there. Thank so you. important. Thank you, Clip. Well, That's so, sorry, Coach, uh, if I could just kind of jump no, in for a second. Please do. So I'm a former college goalkeeper as well. I've had a couple of uh, – Taylor, we lost you. Opportunities with some lower-level pro club story kind of starts, you know. Can you hear me? Nope. I heard we heard that if you could start over, honestly, right when you got into it, you went into like a robotic voice and then we. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Well, uh, yeah, so I've former college goalkeeper. Uh, I've had a couple of uh, semi-pro opportunities here in the U.S., but, you know, my story didn't, you know, start as normal for a lot of other kids who have been playing soccer, you know, since they were knee high. You know, I kind of got into it a little bit later in high school and I didn't have, you know, access to not even just a quality club, not a quality high school team. I didn't really have a good soccer coach. My soccer coach was, you know, kind of sharing duties as the uh, baseball coach. And a lot of the, you know, the effort and the work was put on my own shoulders to kind of go out and seek opportunities. But I say that to say this, you know, don't feel as though, you know, his opportunities are lessened, you know, because he's coming on late. If you find the right coach, and you find the right system. And I believe that you have with, you know, Eric in this, uh, and UGK 
and all the coaches and the work that you've put in so far, and you stay committed to being the best parent, coach, player that you can be for him and your kids, the opportunities will come, mm-hmm. especially for goalkeepers that really focus in on the art of goalkeeping because that's what it is. It's not, you know, just sitting back and watching things go on. It's being a part of the game, being a part of the team, going out, you know, doing the little parts on your own, you know, outside of practice with a trainer uh, on your own, watching the videos, listening to these podcasts like you do when you come on to these uh, videos and these sessions. That's the work that will get you farther out and get you those opportunities. And I promise, you know, like I said, if you just keep that that effort up like you're doing now, the opportunities for him will come along if he wants them. I, I love that, Taylor. And I'm just going to make one comment before we go to the next slide. And, and then parents, please add on. Like, is, I want to see here if this is new to you, too, to Colette's point And, you know, Robert, Erica, some of the other co- parents that just joined, you know, what to look for in a club. This is a, a pretty thorough list. And the one thing I want to echo is Colette's comment about you need to interview the club because they're going to advertise a lot of things that they might not do more of a check the box exercise. Yeah. We offer goalkeeper training, goalkeeper coaching, unless you ask more, they're not going to share. And if you do, here are some of the things listed here to ask for, because remember you're the paying customer. You got, we pay club soccer is expensive, right? It's, it's, there's, there's a comma there and and sometimes a two, three to $4,000. So you should be getting the best, for your goalkeeper. And truthfully, what you see a lot of is the field players getting a lot of this, yeah. right? They have a training curriculum. They have yeah, game yeah. performance feedback from their head coach. They get video analysis. They get coaching education, but do goalkeepers? Nope. It's, it's different. It's so different. So we please, please ask these questions. Taylor made a good point too, about like goalkeepers being alone. And when they're alone and they don't know, that's a dangerous combination. So I like this quote. We used it in our last session on May 23rd, but it really speaks to the loneliness of the position and they're doubting themselves for the most part if they don't know what to do. And I feel a lot of goalkeeping goalkeepers aren't coached. They're trained. So they know how to make a save, but, but during a game, they don't know what to say. They don't know how to set up a wall. They don't know how to um, stay connected with their back line or to, 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 to verbalize and communicate and it's a mental strain and they, they, they get looked at when things go wrong. And as a parent, watch your child when something goes wrong, who do they look at? I'll bet you they're looking at you. So they're looking for you to lead them into what is good for them from a club perspective. That said, before we get into um, starter versus backup with clubs, meaning a good, a great club and a backup or a okay club and a starter i do want to just get back to um any questions or concerns from a parent's perspective i can't see the chat but i do see there is something open in the chat so if someone wants to speak to that yeah i can um i I just chatted that one of the best things my son's uh oh eight and one of the best things we did for him was we found him a great club that actually wanted him. Like before we were going through sort of like, I think how you mentioned Colette, um, just try out good for this team, try out good for this team. And, but then we finally found a club that actually sought him out and wanted him. And it's been probably one of the best things for him. Yeah. Did you see it based on his performance or is it more like mental performance first and then the actual performance on the field was next? What, how did you, how'd that work? So basically they, they didn't know him prior to tryouts. We showed up. So it was, it was his performance at tryouts and they, yeah. they heavily sought him at tryouts and then they had us try out more and he tried out with a few other of their other teams as well. And that's where they really were like, Hey, we really want your son to come to us. Here's, and that's where they went down this list. And I, I actually played, so I, I sort of knew what to ask, which was helpful, but I think just one of the things that you don't have on your list is just have somebody who wants yours, your kid, um, well and put more time and effort in, in training him and making sure that he's, uh, cause I mean, all of us are as goalkeeper parents, we've been on those teams where the coach just berates your kid and that's the worst thing possible. 100%. So I would just add that on there as all. Well. And, and you want to know, in my opinion, I have to preface this before I get all of us in trouble. In my opinion, 
a lot of head coaches don't know anything about goalkeeping. Not a word. Not not, and that is one thousand percent. And what do they do? They 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 also sometimes will contradict. Even if you're getting coaching, not, co- not I'm sorry. Even if you're getting training, not coaching, there is no communication going on between the two. So do does your goalkeeper coach talk to your head coach? You know, do they are they in sync? Because that can really cause confusion and mental performance issues for a goalkeeper if you're doing something in training with your goalkeeper trainer or coach. And then you go to the game and your co- your head coach is telling you to do something totally different or to the berating you for something that they think you did wrong, but in actuality you're working on in training. Yeah. I, I think you hit it spot on there. That's one of the things I've had two things I want to add. I, a lot of clubs, they have goalie. I think you're spot on with trainers. They'll have a goalie trainer and then nobody listens to their advice or what they, who they think are the better keepers. Right. And mm-hmm. so it's picked by the head coach. And then you have a mm-hmm. head coach, like you mentioned, will be telling your keeper, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Or why can't you do that? Or why can't you do that? And especially at the younger ages, it's stuff they've never worked on. Yeah. It's right. something that they don't even know to do. And it's like, look, talk to the goalie trainer and we would love for you to teach him how, but you can't get angry at him when he's not doing it, when he doesn't even know to do it. Yep. <laughs> I guess that I- was... That's great. That's, that's great insight. And then let's get real quickly when selecting a club pros versus cons on starter versus backup. And when I say backup, they're backup on an elite club Mm -hmm. starter on a a mediocre club. Cause I get that a lot. And it's usually an ego thing to be a backup on a great club versus a starter on an okay club. Because remember, the development for a goalkeeper is at a much different pace and tempo than any of the field players. So I just want to focus on the backup piece first, on the left side. So, oops. The backup on a high-quality club. You're getting a high level of training, right? You're playing with elite players. Um, You're winning, probably. You're probably playing ECNL. Um, which again, all awesome things. You're going to be traveling a lot, but you're not going to be playing. That's just hard. You have little to no good game experience. And there's a practice player label that comes with that. As a recruiter, game experience to me is very important because you need to be able to perform in games. It's not how'd you do in practice, how'd you train. You know, even on those great clubs, you need to see them perform in a game setting. Can they have the same vocal leadership and demand that presence in a game compared to training? It's a much different experience. How do they respond when they mess up in a game? Because they're gonna, right? Like what's their, now does it just continue to just go downward? Or if you're that starter, you may have some experience with that and you know how to rebound from that. Is there anything on this backup situation that people would wanna speak to, add to the pro or con list? or just get in deeper depth with one of these? So, so one thing I might add, Eric. Um, Please. Yeah, the, uh, I, I think it's almost age dependent a little bit. I, yeah, so, well said. Um, I, I just think like at a younger ages, you're almost better off being a backup, but you're getting the good training because that's where your development is going to be. But then when, let's say you're at like my son's age is heading into it, like your son is, like you mentioned, right at the peak of it, even though he's middle yep. of high school is you need the game footage for me to show to coaches. I like, that's what they want. And if I'm not in the game, I have no footage. <laughs> so I, I think the only thing I would add is just a little bit, it's, it's age dependent. And I also think as parents, we need to take our egos and put them aside when it comes to our children being on the best team, because the best team, this is what I have learned and I could be totally wrong, but what we've learned for our son, um, the best team for him is him taking shots because he could be on the best team with the best offense and the best defense. And he's picking daisies and that's six foot square, mm-hmm. not getting one shot on goal. That's not going to do anything for him or her. So right. maybe going to that, 
B team might be a better fit for your player so they can get the shots on goal, make great saves, have a, you know, have a good offense defense, but not the best offense defense. So your kid isn't picking date. I always say picking daisies. And that took me last year to put my ego aside when he got into high school. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I want him to have fun. I want him to touch that ball as many times as possible. Wasn't thinking he was going to be touching 30 balls a game, but he did, but it made him a better player. He would never have been the player that he is today without being on that freshman team for right. soccer. Yeah. And, and it, that's, that's an interesting point, Colette, because looking at the, the starter pros, your, your in-game knowledge, your in-game experience in seeing things over and over again in a game setting at the game tempo with game emotions, you know, reacting in a practice versus reacting in a game setting is so different, right? And the, the, the cons, maybe the skill level might not be there. You can be in a good club with great goalkeeper coaching, right? You can, you got to seek them out as we kind of pointed to earlier about what to look for. Um, but that said, you know, you, the, the cons are, you're not going to have anyone pushing you typically if you're that starter. And I'm a big believer in competition. And I believe that goalkeeper coaches should put their goalkeepers in a situational competition on a regular basis to make sure that they're always pushed. Um, and that can be at any club level. Um, the other con is maybe, maybe the team's constantly losing and, and maybe there's a mental performance um, issue that might creep into play. I'm not saying it will, but maybe there's some, you know, the ego with the L's piling up versus the W's piling up can sometimes, you know, can go on their shoulders and get heavier and heavier. So how do we respond to that and develop for me though? And this is me with what I've done um, with my son is I love watching him play. And, and he took some time off due to COVID and he's back and he's on a team where he gets a lot of action and he messes up all the time. <laughs> but as a parent, I, I support that because I know he's getting, and he's learning from, he's getting experience and he's learning from that. And that's okay. That's okay. Cause he's an 07. He's going to be a freshman. So he's in the later part of the year, but he's also um, still plays other sports too. And I'm okay with all that fun stuff because he's not um, I don't think he's losing out. And, and I think it's going to help him in the long run based on his game experience. Whereas if you were on a different team and not playing regularly, um, I don't feel it would have would help his confidence or help his um, his growth, to be honest with you. Could I ask a quick question too? Hi, I'm sorry. My name is Christy. I came in a little late. Thanks for letting me in. I'm sorry Absolutely. about that. No worries. Son, Where are you from, Christy? Uh, we live in Lancaster, uh, California. Okay. Um, and my son is a 2023 okay. uh, goalkeeper, so 05. Um, and so I have a question. My husband and I actually are sitting, I just, I came across and was able to hop on and I'm glad it popped up because this is something we're, you know, we're kind of in the thick of it right now for him. And, right. and this backup versus starter is something that, so he starts, he doesn't start, he plays full game. Then he doesn't like a Saturday, Sunday, one will play one game, one will play the other. And so it's kind of hard. And so I guess looking for some like, what do you do in that situation where you're inviting college coaches out and, you know, and you don't want to sit there, Hey coach, what am I playing? I'm letting college coaches know, but there's no other way than to ask that so that they don't come and then not, see. you know what, it, am I making sense? You're making a hundred percent sense. How me. do you handle that situation? And then what is better? Do you stay with that high level? Like he's ECNL. Do you stay with that ECNL team or, it, and I'm all for the competition. Like you just mentioned yep. competition. We yep. fully believe that you got to earn that spot. Right um, and so it's not any of that, but like, what's best. I don't, I don't, we struggle with that for him. Yeah. I'm going to leave that open though. What do you guys think? So um, I kind of jump in there. Um, I'm always going to kind of lean towards the side of good players will shine pretty much no matter what. And you have to make sure first that your child is, first of all, doing the best that he can do or she can do in the situation that they're in. 
And if you feel that, you know, competition level is fair, it's high enough, they're just not getting, you know, the opportunities based on whatever situation it may be, then go ahead and move them, you know, to a situation that's more favorable to where they can get on the field and trust that they're doing the right things, that they're making the right plays, you know, they're performing at a high enough level and whatever the result may be at the end of the match, good coaches can tell the difference. They can tell the difference between a goalkeeper that's getting scored on, you know, five to six times a match because they're just not up to standard versus a goalkeeper that's getting scored on two to three times a match because they're seeing 14 to 15 shots a match. There is a difference. And I believe that if your child is playing up to that standard, regardless of if they're at a high club or, you know, an average or below club, if they're playing up to a high standard, they will be found. I like that. I'm going to add even at, one. This, even at the um, 2005, like that, cause they're, he's, he's going to be a senior this year. So still, even at that, would you still stick with that? Like recommendation? Like, yes. Yeah, so my okay. senior year of high school was my first year as a starter. And it, <laughs> to be honest, it was abysmal. I was seeing, I mean, like I said, about 15 to 20 shots a match. My team was not very good, but I had a high level of, I had a high number of saves. I had a quality tape to put out. I had coaches from plenty of schools come to watch me play. And I finished school with about two or three offers. And I could have gone, you know, to other schools and tried to get on better teams. But at least for me and my situation, it was a bit too late. And everybody's situation is different. And Mm -hmm. if you feel as though your child's kind of, you know, at the end of the rope and it's like, we have to get them on the field now, we have to get them some opportunity, then I would say, you know, trust that he's the player that you believe in him to be, switch his school and, you know, say, go ahead and shine, go ahead and do the best that you can do and let the result be what the result is. Because there's always going to be schools out there looking for quality goalkeepers. And a lot of times quality goalkeepers don't really show themselves in a stat category, right? Oh, right. Like I said, if you're on a team that's not very good, you might look at the end of the year and say, well, goals allowed for us this season was, you know, somewhere around 50. And, you know, that might look crazy at first, but if you're watching the games, if you're there yeah. evaluating yeah. the player, then you know, well, that number of goals came because, you know, the guys in front of him weren't as good as they could have been. The, and if the you're sharing the goals, not too. Been where it should have been. If you're sharing the goal, you're sharing the stats too. And so like right now, he only has a couple goals on him since March where the other goalkeeper has quite a few, you know? (laughs) That is, that's also very true. I mean, if you guys, if you play for a team where they prefer to split time between keepers, I don't necessarily agree with that. But if that's where you are in a situation, you also have to look at it, you know, kind of, kind of uh, down the line as it is. Whose goals belong to who? Who was the one giving up those goals? I know it's a team sport, but a lot of times, you know, you have to be fair with how you divide stats. Who was the one on the pitch when these goals were given? If we had a match where you played first half and didn't play the second half, if we gave up three goals and two were on him and one was on me, fair is fair. (laughs) So let me ask you this question. If you have, so there's already at the high school that my son goes to, we've been told, that there's already a keeper for his 20, 25 year. So his senior year, there's already a dedicated keeper. Okay, we're in 2022. So I don't know how this coach knows that. So I digress. I mean, my son's 14, six feet tall. He could be six four, six six by the time he is a senior. And he could be better than this keeper that they have there. What do we do in that stamp? Like, how do we showcase him like how do we navigate that so every school kind of sets up how they rotate their keepers differently uh at the high school that I coached for Kingsbury here in Memphis I had a goalkeeper who was a senior who was about 6'4 and I had a goalkeeper who was a junior who was about 5'11 and we didn't go into the season Myself personally, having, you know, a goalkeeper that I said, you know, this guy's going to be the starter because of this, that and the other. But we literally left it up to competition coming into the year and then how the season was falling out, you know, 
where were the mistakes being made, where were the mistakes not being made. Okay. And if you ask your coach uh, and you feel that they're being honest with you about how they're going to divvy up the uh, minutes, I think that you have to factor that in. If your coach is telling you best keeper will play and you believe your child is the best keeper, then I would say you allow him to compete because just like Eric said, you know, you want a goalkeeper that has minutes and you want a goalkeeper that has film, but you also want a goalkeeper who knows how to compete. I personally, I've never been in a, a goalkeeper room at the higher levels when I got into college and above where we didn't have goalkeepers in there that didn't know how to compete. We didn't have goalkeepers in the room that had always had it easy where they were always on a club where it was never someone to kind of be worried about or never looking over your shoulder. You have to have that kind of competitive edge that kind of I want to be the best regardless of who's in the room with me. And so I think, you know, that's a factor that you have to weigh in. And again, everybody's situation is going to be different. And in my opinion, you have to just factor all these things in. How is the coach being honest with me? Do I believe he's being honest about how he's going to divvy up the time? Do I believe that my kid could get good quality minutes at this school? Or is my kid, you know, do I feel that my kid's competitive enough that way if I took him to another school to where he'd play easily, that he'd play up to a high standard? He wouldn't play down to, you know, the level of competition that I moved him to. So those are the right. types of questions that I'd ask myself and I'd be honest with myself about. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I, I like that a lot, what Taylor was saying. I do have something I want to add to that. <clears throat> Where are goalkeepers being showcased? Where are goalkeeper are coaches going to find their goalkeepers and their players? Are they going to high school games? Honest question. Or are they going to these club tournaments during the off season of, of their high school seasons. I'm a high school, co I'm a college coach, excuse me, that recruits. I've never been to a high school game to recruit. That's just the fact for me. Now that might be different for other coaches, but the other thing too is from a club perspective to bring it back to club, you are the paying customer. Their goal clubs is to get an identification and a spotlight of you as the player because you're putting a lot of money into this club to help get your player to the next level in this case the collegiate game i absolutely would sit down with that coach and say we're i'm writing a letter to coaches for this upcoming tournament id tournament in three weeks we're playing three games what is the strategy what games are we going to play? Is it going to be so-and-so gets all of them and so-and-so gets none? Are we going to split them 50-50? Is it going to be one game, 45 minutes each, and the other games we each get a full game? But those are questions you have to ask if you are writing letters to coaches. So if I okay showed up... Ask, my son feels bad asking. No. Like he's kind of like hesitant to ask because, but how else are we to let them know? Exactly. And that's, and that's a fact. And here's the deal. If I were, a, I'm a coach, right? And I'm going to watch your son and he doesn't get on the field. Guess what? <laughs> like, he's off like, that list. You're not coming yeah. back. And he's and, upset about it too, because he sees, you know, like we have a list. I help yep. pass out their brochures. I know who's at the games. He knows who's at the games, you yep. know? So if they're there to see him and he's not there, at, he's, and if he sees you walk away too, that's the hard 100%. part, right? That's the hard part. Like, I don't know how many times, like, don't pay attention. You don't know why they're leaving. Like, just, just do your game, you know, yeah. but they pay attention. Two comments on that. One, if I also showed up and I knew you were playing and you played, that's awesome. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, like so make it worth and just say it like, listen, man, I have coaches coming to watch me play. I want to tell them what games to come watch. So can you help me out with my, our schedule? I'm sure the other goalie's thinking the exact same thing. You know what I mean? So I think it's I think it's only fair that you're spending all this money in a club right. soccer environment to be able to then go to these ID showcase events and be able to be showcased. You know, that's that's the whole yeah. point. That's the point of it, right? Yeah. Okay, thank well, you. One, one thing I would add, and like I said, I have the advantage of having been a coach as well. Uh, the clubs want to promote you going to college. Exactly. 
So use that to your advantage. Yes. Tell the coach, hey, I've already con- my son has contacted this coach. He said he's going to be or they may as a senior, they'll be able to talk to you, but they may not. If they can't, hopefully they talk to your coach as a in between. But then they basically will say, hey, we're going to be at this. Um, yeah, ID we've got ID camps. We've got national and, and yeah. here's the schedule. And, the, and you tell the coach, hey, let me know what games I want to, my son can play in or have your son. That, all this should be directed from your son, actually. But have your son go yes. to the coach and say, hey, <laughs> I, I want, like, what, what times mm-hmm. am I going to be playing? Am I going to play the first half, second half? I'm getting this full game, not that full game. And then you send that schedule to the coach. And you can be, and definitely let them know, like, hey, I've already contacted these coaches that I'm going to be at this tournament. And just keep that two-way communication there because the club wants to say and put out there on their social media or whatever that your son is committed to this school. And so the more they can help you do that, it, it benefits you and them. And the one thing I haven't heard that I love is just finding the right fit. So I think going back to should I play on ECNL or ECNL R as a starter or a backup on ECNL, I think what I would do is look at some of those colleges that you're trying to identify and see where they're pulling players from. If they're not, if they're not, if like, um, and I want to use like division one versus division two, because that, that's meaningless for this activity, but go to the roster and say, okay, here's the clubs that these, that their players are coming from. Here's the level that they were playing at as a youth. And then do the same, like, and if you see people, hey, they're coming from local leagues or they're coming from ECNR, maybe ECNL being the backup isn't necessary. Right. Whereas being at the, uh, if, if you see the club is only recruiting from ECNL, then you're going to need to be at that level. If that's going, if that's the club he, or the colleges that he's looking at, and it's just trying to find that right fit. And I think to um, Coach Taylor's comment is, it's never too late. It just you just have to keep pushing yourself and putting yourself out there to be seen. Mm-hmm. Well said. Well, again, the chat function. I see another. I can't read it but I do know there's another. I typed in thank you, sorry. (laughs) Okay, Um, go right ahead. Yeah. So uh, just kind of to speak to Ms. Christie, uh, like you said, I know a lot of times kids can get a little bit nervous, a little skittish about asking a coach for minutes. And, you know, that's a normal thing. That's a normal thing to have anxiety about. Uh, I think we've all kind of gone through that before when you have to ask somebody for something, even if you felt like you deserved it. But like uh, like Eric mentioned earlier, when you're doing your evaluation or when you're interviewing these clubs about, you know, the best fit for your child to play, you have to ask them, you know, for those minutes and they have to not be afraid of it because you have to be able to measure those coaches and see, do they respect competition? Because me as a coach, I coach for a high school team, I coach for club, and I also uh, do personal training on the side. And I respect competition, especially amongst goalkeepers. I respect that competition. I even had a scenario this season where, as I said, my high school, my high school team where I have a senior and I have a junior, and my junior was playing exceptionally well. And he asked me for varsity minutes. And I took that to the head coach and we hashed it out. And we both agreed he deserved those minutes and he deserved to start that uh, varsity match. And he played well. If you respect competition or if your child is on a team that respects competition, asking for minutes is going to be something that's going to be looked at positively. If you feel like you've played well, if you feel like you've earned them, you should ask for them and they should be given to you. Yeah. I, I want to just piggyback off that. As a coach, I love it when kids come to me asking for time. I love it because it's telling me they're driven, they want more. And they I don't want to hear them talk down to the person they should be playing over. I want to hear them speak highly of themselves and how they're playing and what they're doing. That's making them, you know, perform at the level they are. And to me, that's, that's gold. Can you, Um, Eric, can you say that one more time? My son just came into the room and I want you to tell him about asking for playtime as a, as a college coach, as a college, as a college coach, I absolutely love hearing my players come to me and asking me for minutes because it shows that they're driven. It shows that they have a goal and their goal is not being satisfied and they're working, not, they're trying to work to accommodate their goal. And is it selfish? A little bit, but you know what? It's, there's only one goalkeeper on the field. It's not like they can move you from a number nine down to a number 10 or from a seven to the 11. 
I mean, there's only one number one, right? And and it, then it should be divided up and you should not evenly, but according to how coaches feel they should. And, and if you aren't getting minutes and feel that they're deserved and earned to Coach Taylor's point, in a nice conversational way, it's a life lesson. It's like going to your boss and asking for a raise, right? It's like, it's like asking more out of a relationship. It's like, to me, there's so many life lessons here that, you know, having the, having the communication skills to ask for something you want in a polite way is a hard lesson to learn. And I feel that if sports can help you with that, you're just going to benefit in all facets of communication in your life. Thank I hope you. that helped. Colette. Yeah, you're welcome. Guys, I want to move on real quick. Said, Go ahead, Robert. Hey, okay. So, so my 2010 daughter, she's a, a mid-level uh, club. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's clubs in the area. Probably everyone on this call has, you know, nationally ranked clubs in, in their, in their area. Um, you know, she's doing great. Um, just, is it worth moving to that higher level club? Um, is goalie a specific enough position where you can get recognized between video footage, uh, you know, training seminars, camps, and like our goal, our modern goalkeeper they go to, you know, is there, is that enough of an avenue to get noticed or does she have to go to that top level club um, and try and crack into that? It, 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 you can go to that. Again, it's going to go back to like this, it could end up back here, Robert, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think if you're working with Plogic and Blodge in Jersey, I think they'd give you good guidance as to where your daughter or son or goalkeeper should focus and, you know, to, and talk to them openly about the level they want to play at and what they're looking to do. Um, and I feel they can give you good guidance on that. That's a great question. Did that help Robert? Yeah. I just, I'm just a little be, you know, we're, you know, she's 11 going on 12 and it's, yeah. are, we, are we willing to go to that next level? You know, you have to crack in not only with the, with the team skill wise, but personality wise yeah. as a 12 year old girl. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, is it worth going to that crap, trying to crack into that nationally ranked club or is playing 50 games at a mid-level club starting with video footage and, you know, the, the camps and everything, is that enough to get her exposure? To, to me, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But at, at the same time, I think if you're, if, if you're investigating that higher level ECNL club, I'd investigate the roster. I'd investigate how many goalkeepers they keep, how many teams do they have in that age group. I'd investigate the, all the goalkeeper training or all the goalkeeper stuff we spoke to, what to look for in those first couple of slides. Because again, yeah. back, back to coach <clears throat> Taylor's point, clubs want their kids recruited. And if you have a couple of goalkeepers at a high level playing at a high level, you know, they're going to get minutes. They're going to clubs should work to get you identified. That's what their goal is or what their goal should be at least to that pathway to the collegiate game. Um, so I feel by having those open conversations with your goalkeeper coaches with, with John Plogic and, and Paul Blodgett, if you're working with him um, and the clubs that you're either at and also looking at, I feel those are open questions you can have with them. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I do try to keep these to an hour, but if this keeps going, I'll keep going. I don't have a problem with it, but we're at 55, 0, 50 minutes in. Here's just a quick synopsis as to how I and how we in the UGKA kind of rate clubs and where they stand from a GK coaching perspective. Based on due diligence, my own and who we've spoken to, we've spoken to Sugar 30, 40 different clubs in the last three months. Majority of clubs are in the three to four range. Think about that. You're paying a top dollar and you're getting one GK, one GK coach across all age groups, one isolated training session a week. So you're getting sessions once a week with a pretty diverse group. Or number four, non-age specific, isolated GK training once a week. And then you're getting GK player evaluation maybe once, twice a year. Um, clubs don't invest in goalkeeper coaching. They just don't. Based on what I'm seeing, it's very rare to see a seven, eight, nine. It, it, um, never mind a 10. So if, if you have a club that, that, you know, again, this is about paying good money for your players to develop. And it might not be with that top ECNL club. It might be with a lower level club that's in the green based on this slide. 
compared to an ECNL club that might be in the red. And that's a mistake on the ECNL team's behalf. I'm, I'm using ECNL as just a frame of reference here. I'm sure every ECNL has awesome coaching, but I just don't want it to come across in a negative fashion. I feel I should say that. Real quickly, guys, where do you see your clubs and what you, who you're currently working with? Do you surprise me? Do you see anyone in the green? Does anyone work with the green? Do people in the so, red? Where are you? Yeah, so I, I can speak up. I will say um, right now this club my son is at, I definitely feel like is a seven to an eight. Um, maybe even teetering on a nine, but that's only at, like he plays MLS next. So he's at the highest level. Awesome. The levels below him, don't receive the same i guess love than the level that he sees so like he him he, there's two keepers on his team and they both get video analysis they both have mentoring programs where they're training with the u18s and u17s at the keeper level uh, in fact my son just had a training tonight where he was practicing with the o6 teams mls teams so it's and they're at their, his games, giving him evaluation at the games, like you talked wow. about. They're doing all that. But I can tell you, if you're at the next level down, you, you get the same keeping, the same trainers and everything else, which is nice, because I know not every club does that. So they're at least getting the same training, but they're not getting that next extra level. There's not the video analysis. There's not the – so I, I think even from a club perspective, like it inside the club, it depends – yeah, that's oh, interesting yeah, as well. I've never heard that. I would think that would be if you're in the eat the club. And by the way, MLS Next is the highest level of of boys soccer in the United States, whereas in the girl side, it's kind of ECNL. Um, but that's awesome that you're getting that experience because that's going to just going to skyrocket their development. That's fantastic. That really is great to hear. And then unfortunately, on our end, ECNL, we're in the red. I believe that. We're in the red, and we we were DA. Yep. So it's it's a it's a bummer. We spend a lot of outside time going to goalkeeper specific. Uh, we're with Jeff Tackett out here. Nice. So, That's uh, great. Yeah. yeah. So we spend time with him and and another one too. So. Where are other? There's probably like three other. Like Colette, let me ask you. Where where would you say your club is on this scale well, here? We've we did the GPS, we did the ECNL. So we're not doing those anymore. Um, <laughs> okay. That's my, I think for my son at the age that he started those clubs really impacted him negatively. And, um, you know, as it, it, you know, he's going to be a doctor when he grows up, quote unquote, he's not going to be a D1 athlete at least I don't think he is. I don't, he's not going to be playing for FC Buffalo. So I think for him, he looks at it like, you know, I mean, and who knows what it's, what's going to happen, but right. we're looking for a club right now because yeah. we left the one club he was at the Clarence uh, club that he was at because they said that, um, you know, he had to earn his spot on the team. Well, he had the most saves. He showed up for every practice never missed a goalkeeper session was practicing during COVID three days a week with the club's goalkeeper coach, not Marcelo, a different guy. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically told us that he hadn't earned his spot. And I said, well, if that's not earning your spot, I, I don't know what you expect earning your spot. I don't know what you're earning your spot is. So that's when we took a step back and said, and that's when he made the high school team, his high school team, and he was the starting goalkeeper um, for him. You know, I'll never forget it. He walked into our, into our bedroom and said, I don't want to play for Clarence. I want to play for my high school. And I said, okay, I'm giving you one year off, but right. you, you got it. You are not going to be able to make, you're not going to be able to play on a high school team, your junior and senior year, unless you're playing throughout the season. I mean, I'm sure there are kids that do it, but, and as a goalkeeper, you have to be in front of players. Yeah. So we're like right now, I'm I'm scrambling to find them a club just to try out at. So it's 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 tough. It's a lesson to learn. He's our only child, and um, you know, but they did not respect him. And I think as a 14 year old to 
uh, see that, that he was not being respected. Um, and he's a good kid. I mean, you can ask Marcelo. He is, he is really a good kid. He's polite. He's humble. He never throws his hands down on the field if a goal goes in. He never blames any of the guys in front of him. He's just a good, well-rounded kid. That's why I'm glad that, you know, when he walked in, when you were saying that, because he is a little bit shy and quiet when it comes to that. And I'm not. So it's hard for me. But when he's on the field, he's a beast. Like he will call, he will charge after a kid. He grew six inches this year. So let's just say, you know, fresh, <laughs> early freshman year when he was, you know, five, five, um, he was charging kids that were, you know, close to six feet, 80 pounds on him right. and didn't even blink an eye. And I'm like, who is this kid? So I think that he gained his confidence being on this. So I think for us, it's just hopefully having some coaches that have worked with him help us find a place for him to play. So that's, that's where I'm at. And I, and I think if I had to give any suggestions to any parents out there, and I'm sure um, Christy might say the same thing, you know, there's certain things we do as parents that we think is the best interest for them mentally, you know, mental health wise. I don't regret pulling him from that team. They hadn't even started the season yet. So it wasn't like he was bailing out of the wedding the night before. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, him just Good saying, analogy. <laughs> I mean, cause that's really what, you know, and that bridge is burned now, but I don't want him playing on a team that doesn't respect him showing up to everything and being in the game yeah. and being respectful to the refs. When you have other players who are not respectful to the ref, who get the playing time, who aren't as good. So that's just, so now it's just kind of like, we're just trying to find a club. Yeah. Which, which kind of brings us to our, our training, our, our tryout kind of strategies. And, yep. and everyone has different strategies, guys, but kids in particular, it's like taking a test that they're just, they, that they don't enjoy it. No one, they don't enjoy tryouts. No one enjoys taking a test. And, and especially what if something were to go wrong? What if a ball goes through their hands in the first 10 minutes? How do they regroup from that? And if, if I hope you guys can see this and read this. This, this to me is, was put together by Andreas Papakastas. I love saying that name. Um, he's out of Chicago as well as in, out in Arizona and Phoenix. And he owns Olympic Goalkeeping Academy. And here you're going to see his 20 tips and ideas. And I just want to emphasize number 20 because this is a game. It's a kid's game. And it can be a pathway to a, a great, something that's awesome, something that's great, something that's going to help you with financially, with college, possibly. At the same time, it's a game. And, and that's the one thing that when I speak to my kids about, like I will, I fully watch my kids play as a parent. I'm not vocal during games at all. I, I'm not even on the ride home. I, I just enjoy watching my boys play. And if they come to me asking me questions, I have no problem sharing my, my, um, my advice and, and tips to them. Um, at the same time, when I speak to coaches, when my, let me rephrase, when my sons speak to coaches, I'm standing right next to him, but I am not saying a word. And I make that, I make a point of that to say my, me and my son, my son wants to talk to you. I'm going to be present. I'm not going to say a word. My son wants to speak. And, and they're, my oldest son, who's 14 is getting to the point now where I don't have to be present. Um, meaning he's capable of handling himself and having educational, like, I'm sorry, having intelligent conversations and can speak for himself, which is great. Um, my other son is 11. I still stand next to him and whether, whatever sport, whatever, whatever it is, I want him speaking to the coach because it's his playing time. It's his team. It's what he wants to do, but I'm always going to support him. So just standing in behind him, standing right next to him, answering questions, being there in case a coach, you know, flips out or loses it and goes off, but that's never happened. But for me, it's really been about the life lesson of being able to speak clearly about what it is you're looking for. And whether that's with a coach, whether that's with a parent, whether that's with a teacher or a boss, that's a life lesson that's going to be invaluable, hopefully, to them one day. Um, and they're still developing that. But it's really good for me to see them, if you look at the bottom right corner, thank all the coaches. I, my kids walk up to coaches after every single game practice and give them knucks. Thanks, coach. 
you have any idea how much that resonates? When I have kids that do that to me after sessions and come up to me and go out of their way just to say thank you and knuckle me, that makes my day. And, and I remember all those kids. And I'd say the same to my, my own two boys. Like, you make sure you respect these guys and make sure you respect their time and just be a good kid to, to collect to your point. And I feel that that will go in a long way and it will shine in the long run. Any questions about tryouts though? Cause I know they're happening all over the country right now and anxieties are all over the place. And if there's things that I can elaborate on or you'd like to elaborate on guys, coach Taylor, if there's anything you'd like to add, um, anybody, please feel free to, uh, to grab the mic. I have a, a question. It, my daughter, because she's a 2011, the, she just um, told the coach back in January she wanted to dedicate to the keeper position and they um, and she's been rostered on essentially the B team this first year that she was on the club this past year. The A team keeper has been there for the past couple of years. And so she went into the tryout and did her absolute best. And I tried to prep her saying tenure might play a factor. You only dedicated for half the season in the fall. She was 50, 50 field and keeper. And it really came across in the email to the current team going into the tryouts that I don't want to say it was a guarantee, but pretty much the previous year's performance had a very heavy weight on those that were already at the club on what was going to happen. And I took it as the trials were really looking for that golden goose that was coming into the club to try and acquire them. So what would your be advice be to my daughter's trials already happened um, two weeks ago and she already was told she's rostered as the B keeper and they have three teams and only three keepers. So what would your be your advice if that's kind of the mindset going into this next year, because she has flat out told me and through me because she does not have the courage yet to talk to the coach. And I, I tried to tread very lightly because I do not want to come across too aggressive um, and be that parent that she, she wants the A team spot. So I guess what would be your advice if that's kind of going into of knowing this next year is where she's trying to prove herself going into the following year's trial. What's your, what's your goal? What's, what's her goal? Yeah. Her goal is she wants to play uh, on the best team and be the best keeper on that team. And eventually I believe she will want to play in college. She's a three sport kid and she does not want to quit any of those sports just yet. And we're allowing her to continue with that as long as we can find the balance between it. Um, uh, my advice to her going into the tryouts was it's not a bad thing that you're on the B team right now. You're, the amount of shots and game action that you have seen in this past year is much higher than that A keeper. And you're learning, you've grown. Like I personally have seen her grow immensely in this past year. And so when I had the conversation with the coach, he agreed with my kind of comment to her that it's not a bad thing. And he actually admitted this past year, he probably should have split the keepers between A and B. Last year, the teams weren't set. This year is the first year they're set and the girls can't move between them. You can't move at all, even within the own, their own club? He's, it, it's alluded to that potentially there could be, but I'm personally not fully convinced that it will happen. Um, that keeper has been there for years. That keeper is in the same school district as the coach. Mm. The entire travel team for that district is on our team now. Yep. So I'm a little concerned. I know she's getting very good education and things of that nature, but my husband and I are concerned in the future of what is even the potential of our daughter moving on. Here's, here's what I'll, here's my advice. She's a 2011. Yes. And I know she's young. And so that's why I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to prep myself for years for it. So thank you all the other parents for talking because yeah, I am yeah. taking notes. And I'm trying, in my mind right now is, when does this become- That's where I was going with this. More critical. Yep. Because she's it. 11. Good. Yep. You, just took, you just took my comment out of, okay. my, out of my mouth. <laughs> now, here's what I'm going to tell you. 
I'm a division one coach that recruits. I've never looked at anybody's statistics or background or anything under their age of like freshman year. Okay. And I mean that the kid, he's a, she's 11. She should be worried about having fun and making sure she brushes her teeth before she goes to bed. You know what I mean? Yes, I promise you. <laughs> and Dad, I, where I were you years ago, Eric? Where were you? <laughs> where were you? My hair because is gray. Where were what, you? <laughs> well, what's going to happen? Fun comment too, right? You can't sit because if you push so hard, you take the, away the joy, the love, yeah. and the fun for yeah. the game. It's and so, so yeah. they oh, so have true. to enjoy it in order to truly, truly have that deep rooted long-term passion for the game and love for the game, because it can be stripped from them so quickly. Don't take it too soon. (laughs) Yeah. But don't you think Christy, don't you think that like, once they get to high school, they find their people like my son's two best friends. He met day one of tryouts at his high school. And that, that changed everything for him. I think playing uh, with uh, like my son couldn't play high school until this year because he was DA and then last year, you know, COVID and all that. Um, It's a different, whole different ball game when they're playing with their childhood and good friends that they've grown up with and stuff, because, you know, sometimes people have to go different places and do different things. And that's kind of where my son was. And we just, the, the love of the game was so, I mean, he definitely loves it deeply, but it was something different when he was playing for his high school and playing with all of his best buds again. Um, it, it, that love and that passion for that game, it's worth everything. Yeah. And, and that's really what I'm trying to instill. In our, I, I never played in college. I was a sweeper, but I tore my ACL going into my sophomore year. So it kind of ruled me out for everything back in the day. And so I'm trying to teach her the love of not just soccer, but the other sports that she has. And I want her to truly decide. And she made a decision earlier this year. She really only wants to be a keeper, um, which is fantastic. But I'm I'm like torn on how I don't want to push her too much because she's 11. But I like, like, no, this is what I want to do that designated time, right? This is, you know, because my son was a forward also, uh, before he designated about U10. uh, Nope, I'm going to be a keeper. This is where and and it, it changed everything too. So just those work ethics, right? Keep working on those work ethics, those life skills. Um, I know that he mentioned earlier too, right? Because everything is a life lesson. And so if she has this goal, right? Keep that love, that balance where you don't want her to ever hate the game, you know, Um, or regret the memories and the lessons that she's learned along the way. I don't know. I'm a teacher too. So that's just my passion, (laughs) right? For helping those guys. Love it. (laughs) Well, thanks for all your teaching. My wife homeschools, uh, so we definitely feel for you teachers. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I obviously we've heard of kids in college who have recently committed suicide, which is yeah. devastating. And I think I can't stress enough what everyone else has said about just making it fun and um, the mental aspect of it and have it being kid driven. One thing for your daughter, though, that I just it's sort of my son's path that he went through is he was at tryouts and he didn't make a team uh for whatever reason i can't tell you i don't know if it was political i don't know what happened but we were at a club he was on their third team everyone really liked him and then we just didn't get called yep and i don't know if they just forgot his name i I have no idea what happened but anyway so we talked to the doc and, and one of the coaches stepped up and said look we'll take him but we already have a keeper and this was actually the year before he made the MLS next team. And, but he played field player the whole year. So we did goalie training. We practiced as a keeper with as many teams as we could. And he got game times with some of the older teams as they needed. Um, but for the most part, he was their leading goal scorer on the team that he was on. And then the next year I asked him, well, do you want to continue being a forward or do you want to be a keeper? And he's like, no, I want to be a keeper. And I said, okay. So that's when uh, we tried out with the MLS next team and even though he had he didn't play keeper in his age the year prior this I think goes to what you were talking about earlier coach Tyler like if you're good you'll be found yeah <laughs> um, um that so I I want to stress too much as to what team she's on obviously at the age she's at but even <laughs> you can hear my wife um but just <laughs> you know, but but I think it's just key to keep them having fun and they'll, they'll do well. 
and um, if they want it and work hard, they will be they will be noticed. I love that. You said that very well. Oh, I go ahead and get in there. Yeah, Taylor, go ahead, man. Yeah, so uh, I forgot who was speaking. I think it was Miss uh, Erica, if I'm correct. Yes. But uh, I just kind of went through this whole scenario with uh, one of the children that I trained. Uh, I coached her on uh, her club team. She's actually about the same age as your daughter. Uh, she's about 12 years old now. She was 11 when we kind of went through this situation. Um, she wanted to be our goalkeeper. Uh, usually for the clubs that she had played before, they usually let all the kids, you know, try all the positions, but she wanted to be a goalkeeper. And so I kind of started mentoring her and coaching her. And she was going into middle school, like headed that way. And she was going to try out for uh, her middle school team. And what she was kind of having problems with, uh, with her mother, kind of like in the same situation, her mother was an athlete in high school. And she could be, you know, kind of one of those mothers that kind of, you know, go, 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 go. And, you know, I kind of took her to the side respectfully. And I told her, your daughter doesn't need two coaches, right? She doesn't need two coaches. She needs a coach or a trainer. And then she needs a fan, a number one fan at this age. Because she's so young that you're her mom. And so everything that you tell her or everything you pour into her, she's definitely going to cling to it. She may not act like it, but she is. She's going to take that to heart and she's going to use that every day. And if you're pushing so much into her and she also has a coach that's pushing so much into her at a young age, that could just be so stressful, especially as a goalkeeper, where we know that this is a position where there's already just stress that, that just comes with the job, just comes with the job. So there doesn't need to be, you know, multiple avenues just bringing in stress but there needs to be somewhere where the stress gets poured out and she doesn't need, you know, necessarily sympathy from you, but more or less empathy, right. Where you can tell her, I don't necessarily understand like what you're going through as a goalkeeper. Cause I don't know, you know, like your player history. I don't know if you were a goalkeeper or not, but. I was only a sweeper. So yeah. I, I try the empathy, not to interrupt. I try to do yeah. the empathy and the only coaching I give her. And I tell her this all the time is, I can only tell you from what I know from being a sweeper and she's still in the early stages of like just the spring season. I taught her to tell your defense to hold the 18, like super simple stuff. I'm trying to like tell her because she's not getting that from her coach. Other than that, I always say to her at the end of the game, like, she's like, I let, I let this goal in or, or this happen. I should have went out for the breakaway. And I said, you know what, Sam, whatever you did, like, that's fine. You're figuring out your mistake and you're telling me what to improve on. So that is what I want to hear from you. I don't care about the score. I don't care how many went in. I will like, if you thought you played the best that you played, then I am absolutely happy with how you played. Mm -hmm. I actually have one of my old goalkeepers in here right now. We're actually going through tryouts as well. And but like I said, like with her, in a situation, I ask every single one of my goalkeepers, no matter what the age is, no matter what the level of experience is, I ask them at the end of practice, I ask them in a tryout or the end of a game, how do you feel, right? How do you feel? Yeah. And because they don't always need me to tell them, you know, the tactical mistake or the, the uh, physical error or whatever the case may be, or maybe even like a mental issue that they're having. Sometimes they just need me to be an emotional outlet. They need to come to someone who maybe not, I obviously I understand as a former goalkeeper, so I can give them a little bit of sympathy, but sometimes even the situations where I can just give them empathy as in, I'll just listen to you. I'll hear, you know, how you feel, what that frustration is, and I'll just listen, right? And I'll just take that. And then I'll say, you know, it is what it is. I have your back. I'm your number one fan right now. I'm here for you. Let me know how you feel, vent that frustration, and then we can move on from that. And that, uh, and I believe that you are the type of parent that's going to find her the best coaching situation that she can. But as it is right now, you know, like you said, keep doing what you're doing as a uh, as a great mother, as a great mother to a goalkeeper. This is what this is all about. You know, parents of goalkeepers, you know, just keep being empathetic. Keep listening and allow her to just have fun. Right. Because if she just keeps having fun with it going forward, she'll get better on her own. The best the best players are the ones that know how to have fun. They know how to, you know, not take themselves too serious. I take the moment too serious and like just carry that with them. They got to let it go. Say, all right, chalk it up to it's a game. I'll get better. 
and I, I kind of just leave it at. I used to say to my son that, you know, when he was that age, I would say, you know, like if it was what, 77, is that what it was? I don't even remember. It was so long ago, but I would say <laughs> like, there's seven other kids in front of you and their job is to keep that ball away from you. So don't like, and, it, and that wasn't putting down those other kids on the team, but each, each player on the team has a role. And so that would make him feel better. Like, yeah, but he goes, but mom, I, I didn't do this. Okay. So you, now, you know, you didn't do this, but it's not that goal going in that net is not solely on you. So, and sometimes that just helps them feel a little bit better about themselves. I mean, I've seen keepers and we've all seen them throw their hands on the ground. They're flailing their bodies all over the place. Like we don't want our kids to do that. We want them to just know that it's okay to let that ball go in. And it's, you know, yeah, I've just, said that to her. And when she faced her first couple penalty kicks, she got really upset. And after the game, she was super upset. And I was like, Sam, I was like, here's the thing with penalty kicks. One, they're not made for you. And two, it's not because of you most of the time that you get the penalty kick. It's because of someone else on your team, but you're the one taking right. the brunt of it. <laughs> so, right. And it you really, I mean, you have to be some kind of keeper to save penalty kicks. I mean, it's, there's a, there's a real talent to it. And I'm sure that Eric and, you know, Taylor would say the same thing mm -hmm. for me. My son always was a goalkeeper. He never even stepped foot on the pitch in any other role than a goalkeeper. So like, he doesn't, that's probably like, our downfall as a parent where he should have played a couple other roles on the field to learn different positions. But I mean, I don't even know if he would know how to be a striker. Do you know what I'm saying? Like now at the same. <laughs> uh. Could I ask a question? I know I asked it, but it's this, it's where we are with my son right now in that whole trying out 2005 class of 2023. Yep just afraid that it's not the right time to be moving or questions will come, but we know that he has to, like, we have to look at other options. He has to, I, I say we, uh, cause I'm talking yeah. to you, but he, he runs the show. He has the conversations with the coaches, but I feel like we're at that point where like, we have to go check out other things. Yeah. Um, but the fear is, is that the wrong move this late in the game? I think if you, make those calls to the code to the teams that are having tryouts and ask them about what it is they're looking to do and how your son might fit into their program and ask all the questions that we kind of spoke to today and write up that pro con list for each club yeah he's really good at that he slept before he left his home team uh, like he grew up with, he slept with a pro and pros and cons sheet next to his bed for probably yep. two, three weeks. Yep. Um, and just, you know, had to make the decision that was best for himself, but that was a while ago. So, and, and truthfully though, I think that you, you need it. And this is going to all circle back to the UGKA and why it is what, it, what, what it is we do and why we do it. There's education needed for parents. There's education needed for kids. There's a network that's needed for us to do better. And whether that's connecting with colleges and, and networking that way to help, you know, if you have a video of uh, that, that he has that he'd like to market, send that to me. Like we're, I, we're Taylor and I are in a, Taylor and I are in a chat group of over a hundred goalkeeper coaches from across around the world. Yeah. Over 50 of them are in the NCAA game or in the collegiate game, you know, whether it's NAIA, NCAA, D1, D2, D3, JUCO. And, and we have access to many different coaches who know other coaches, right? And we are all in to help each other out. <clears throat> and if we don't need a goalie, but I might know someone who, 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 who does. And I think sometimes that one of the benefits to the UGK is kind of, you, you see them all here, you know, a little selfless promotion. Sorry, guys. But same time, you but know. it's true. We we're, <laughs> goalkeepers are a different breed. Yes, you know they're they're one in their own, and 
not every coach sees them the same way. I mean, my kid is great. He has areas he can improve on. Mm -hmm. I love that, you know, there's the competition set forth for him and he's willing to have those difficult, difficult conversations. But if you don't have the goalkeeper community, it it's, I think, I think it's difficult for them sometimes. Yeah. And I'll, I'll kind of, um, you know, I'll just kind of go over what I said earlier and I'll die on that hill. You know, I'm, because if anybody's living proof of it, I just genuinely believe that I am. Yeah. They're going to find you. They're going to find you. Good goalkeepers are so valuable. They're so valuable. And don't be afraid of not getting, you know, to the D1 level. I know that's for some he's reason. Okay. There's yeah, he's a, my kid's okay with that. He, yeah. He's like, I just want to play. I just want to play. Yeah, I love the game. I want to play. That's awesome because a lot of people have the stigma that if I don't go mm -hmm. D one or if I don't get into, you know, this high level club or team, that that means I'm not good. But right. there's so few players that actually make it to the college level. Yep. And soccer is such a broad sport. I mean, it's played all over the world. There's clubs all over the world. And if you want to pursue a career in it and you have the talent, you have the ability, someone's going to find you. Somebody's going to want you to play. And, you know, as long I always tell my goalkeepers, you know, it's kind of, you know, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. I'm down here in the South. We say it all the time. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And if you stay ready, if you stay ready for that call, always, you know, keeping that one eye open, someone's going to call you. Someone's going to call you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, you guys, very much. So, guys, selfless plug here. <laughs> What we do, what we can help with, what's needed, and a lot of things we spoke to today. Um, and then questions, I kind of figured we went over them as we went along. Hold on, one more selfless plug. Training opportunities in the Cranberry area, which is in Pittsburgh. I know some of you from all over the country, so I'm just going to leave that there um, just for a second. Last one's the residential camp. We're... we're at close to capacity, I think we're at 75, 80%. We have around 10 more opportunities. If anyone's looking to join, we are having people fly in from Florida and come in from Ohio and New Jersey and upstate New York and sugar. I met at Pittsburgh area, the Eastern PA and 10 spots left. We're only having 65 kids. We only, we have 10 coaches, a six to one student teacher ratio. I don't believe in lines. I believe in small group training to be most effective, which is how this is going to be set up. We're also not looking to beat up your body or the kid's body. We want them coming out of there, not only confident in their playing abilities, but confident from a mental performance perspective. We do have classroom sessions and we do take care of their bodies. We have in the morning and at night, we have rollout sessions and stretching and dynamic movements. In addition to pool yoga, <laughs> where we're getting the kids in the pool during the hottest part of the day. Um, and we're going to be training at night. So we're trying to stay out of the 90 degree heat that sometimes comes our way in late July. But again, there are 10 spots still available. Please reach out to me personally, if there is of interest or for any local goalkeepers that want to train in the Cranberry area training started today, my season, my season opened today and I'm super happy and I love it. Um, and then guys, here's my contact information. If you guys need anything, um, I am, I, <laughs> I remember saying around 45 minutes ago that we were going to stop at the hour. <laughs> I want to thank you for sticking around and having this dialogue. This is needed. And it, if we can get more parents involved and put out topics and speak to topics that are important for parents, please let us know what you want to hear about. You know, this started out as a mental performance thing and a met versus mental health. And, and can we be doing, can we do the right things for our kids? You know, now it's into, you know, the anxieties around tryouts and selecting the right club. And obviously there's concerns and questions there, whatever you from as a parent want to learn more about, so you can better support your goalkeeper reach reach out to me with a call or a text email. Don't think twice. We're going to do this the first Monday of every month. And I greatly appreciate your participation tonight. Coach Taylor, thank you for working alongside me tonight. And guys, I'm just going to leave it here. If you guys have any questions or comments, um, please, please let me know right now. I'll answer last questions. So, Eric, I guess I'll just jump in real quick. One question I do have, and it sort of revolves around being seen and noticed. And I know people are talking about colleges. 
Um, from a keeper perspective, is it any different to be recruited from a college? Is it like, can you get recruited from a camp basically is what I'm trying to say. Cause I know like from a football perspective as a kicker, they actually do almost all their recruiting from camps. They don't even look at club or high school anymore. It's all almost all from camps. And, and I was thinking of it as a keeper, I wonder if that's similar because it is such a unique position. Right. That's a great question. And for me, I haven't heard of people recruiting at camps to be perfectly honest with you, but that's a, here's what I know in the camp that we're putting forward, I think everyone but one is a college coach. Nine, and that's just who we are. That has nothing to do with selecting it that way, but that's a great point. Um, wow, I, I never even thought of it that way before. Great question. I, I, I don't think so. Taylor, yeah, go ahead, man. Yeah, if I can give a different perspective. So down Please. here, um, I know it might be different up farther up north, but down here uh, in the south, we have ID camps at uh, a lot of universities right. and they do recruit pretty, uh, pretty deeply from those ID camps. You know, if you uh, know a university that's hosting an ID camp, a lot of times they invite, you know, other uh, colleges out to also watch and evaluate players. Uh, I don't see, I don't really know any university that, uh, you know, would turn down a good player if they showed up, you know, because a lot of teams uh, still recruit deeper into the summer. Uh, they have a couple of roster spots that are left open. Maybe, you know, it won't always be, you know, guaranteed minutes for that spot. But if they could just go ahead and fill that roster out, they will take players from those ID camps or they'll, like uh, Coach Eric said, they shop names around. A lot of coaches talk to each other. A lot of coaches mm -hmm. know each other, have relationships. And so I might not need a goalkeeper, but I know Eric needs a goalkeeper. And me and Eric, you know, we talk. We are in the same circles. I might call him and say, hey, I had a goalkeeper showed up to my ID camp, played very well. Maybe you'd be interested. I can connect you if you want. So, mm -hmm. you know, any opportunity for exposure, I would take it. I would you know, take it. Taylor, Taylor, you bring up a good When I was thinking camps to the question, I was literally thinking of selfishly my residential camp and like a camp shutout or like something like that. But from an ID camp, from an ID perspective at universities, 100% agree. Now, we could have a whole nother long conversation about ID camps, the money makers versus the real like, like offer to come join us in the ID camp. Um, and I mean that sincerely. A lot of them, a lot of these ID camps help fund their programs. And, and you got to be careful for those. That's, that's legit. We're, we're doing, so like my son's doing camp shout out this year and we're, in, we're actually in the South too. We're in Florida. Um, and we'd be interested in potentially your camp next summer, Eric, I didn't know of your camp <laughs> until just now, but that's something I would definitely like, I think just getting that exposure and sort of yeah. where I'm, my thought is right now is having our son, like he's still young. Yep. I mean, he's, he's going to be a, he's a rising freshman. So we've done some college ID camps locally just to get him in that mindset. Yep. Um, but it's more of like, Hey, can you be seen? Can you push yourself to play a, even though you're a rising freshman, how are you going to compare against those kids that are four years older? Cause like I said, I was a coach. I know that they're comparing you against kids four years older when they're looking at you. Yep. Um, so that's something to think about. And I would love that. I guess going forward, that would be an amazing session that I would definitely tune into. <laughs> nice. That, that, honestly, that might not be a bad idea, but would I'll, and, and lastly, guys, this is what the UGK is about, man, from educating kids, educating parents. There's just, it's hard. It's a hard position to be good at. It's a hard, it's a, even a harder position to be great at. And it, there's a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of who you know involved, good and bad from a political standpoint, as we discussed today. Um, so I feel these types of opportunities for parents to talk, compare notes, tell horror stories, tell great stories is, is good because it will allow you to understand that despite what we're going through with my, my son or my daughter, someone's gone through it and I can now get advice and I can work with them on these situations, um, whether it's identification, whether it's mental performance, whether it's picking the right club, um, the camp situation to what we were just talking about. That's, I, I, I love this conversation. So I, I, I appreciate all you and the points today were, were awesome. Thank you. No, thank you, Eric. Thanks for sticking around for an extra 30 minutes too. You, <laughs> thank you. And you too, coach. 
Hey, can you guys say that louder so my wife can hear that, please? Awesome. You guys kick butt. Have an awesome week. Have an awesome summer. It's the kickoff to our summer season here in Pittsburgh. If you Thank ever you. have questions, comments, complaints, this is what I do full time. I was in corporate finance. No more. I love doing this. Been doing it for eight years. Please reach out with any type of suggestions, comments, or even just to talk. Guys, have an awesome one. Thank you for all you do. Appreciate it. Thank you, Coach Taylor. Oops. Hey, uh, Eric, before I hop off here. One sec. Uh